what I'm going to show you is the basics of remote influencing. Now, as though somebody took 30 minutes to show you the basics of remote viewing and said, that's it. And you said, oh, that's all there is? No, that's far from all there is. But what I'm going to show you is uh, the basics of remote influencing and why most people fail at it. There's kind of a phenomenon that happens with many students. The mystique of remote viewing and all that, the, the magic and mystique and everything. And then they come for the class and they find out it's really nuts and bolts and structure and the mystique is gone and we don't see them again. And because finding the reality is never as beautiful and enhancing and, and all that as, you know, entrancing as the, uh, as the nuts and bolts. I'm going to be showing you some of the nuts and bolts and I hope it's not a big letdown for you because I know that this mystique has built up around remote influencing. Remote influencing in a way deserves the mystique because it, uh, when taken to its limits, just like CRV, um, it's best described by the word magic. First of all, let's go over uh, remote viewing. I'm always surprised that many people don't know this. The theory behind CRV is that you're getting information from somebody else or some other place in the world, but let's just talk about getting information from somebody else's mind. First of all, at a conscious level, you say, I have a question. And you want to get that uh, question to your subconscious mind. Okay, after you get it to your subconscious mind, then there's that great unknown. By the way, does anybody know what Ingo means by when he says the matrix? And it's, it's the great unknown. What's down here, we don't care. We just wanna get the information from the subconscious to the conscious. However, look at that. Anybody ever heard the name Lemon before? You've all heard it. Anything up here is supraliminal. Anything down there is subliminal. Um, by the way, that brings up a point uh, that I probably need to stop right now <clears throat> and say that um, <coughs> some of you know my background in psycholinguistics and subliminals. I will be using subliminals in this presentation, if you don't want them used against you, you probably ought to leave because I'm going to use them anyway. Um, uh, if I find that the material here has caused someone here to start using this in a way which hurts people, um, I will set up the triggers. <clears throat> I will pull those triggers and you will not be able to do it anymore and I'm going to put those subliminals in during this session. If you don't like it, that's too bad, I'm sorry. You're, the door's not closed, okay? This is us as we relate to the great unknown. The information is not gonna go through that lemon, okay? The question, the answer is not gonna go through there. The theory behind CRV is you're gonna use the body as a translator between the two because the conscious and subconscious don't talk to each other. Therefore, how do you start out? You start out with a physical ideogram. How do you continue? You continue getting physical sensories and then dimensional impressions, which very quickly turn into visuals. So you're back into body impressions, <laughs> body signals. Uh, I generally repeat this about a hundred times before it sinks into anyone. CRV is a physical discipline, much like a martial art. It is not just a mental discipline. It is a physical discipline as well. Every bit is, it's a mental martial art is what it is. Okay, the lemon, you can't do anything. 
to get information through there. So we've got a question up here. We've got our body that we're going to use to bypass the lemon to get something into our subconscious to somehow filter into this great unknown and go all the way over there and find out what's in that guy's mind. And so we pass the question as a coordinate. Everybody ask what the coordinate's for? Two things, one to get you physically involved and two to get your hand moving so when the ideogram happens, you know. What does the coordinate mean? It doesn't have to mean anything. It gets your hand moving. <laughs> That's one of the main purposes of the, uh, of the coordinates. And so we somehow, using the body, get the question we have into our own subconscious. Then somehow the great unknown channels things over to our target. And it gets into that subconscious over there. Hopefully, that subconscious will send back an answer to our subconscious. Now what? We've got the lemon. We have something that goes through the body and brings the information back to the conscious mind. Uh, this is why you write. This is why you sketch. This is why you continue to do ideograms. Um, this is why you continue even through stage six to do clay modeling all kinds of charts and graphs, you got to get physical. The more physical you get, the better you're gonna remote view. Now, controlled remote influencing theory, to put information into somebody else's mind. Okay, we have ourselves and the subconscious mind of the targeted person. We also have that target person's conscious mind. That's where we really want to get things. However, looky there, that person also has the lemon. So that person also has a body. Now then, when we send the question down, it goes over to the subconscious and, uh-oh, all we were able to affect was that person's body. We hope that some information will come back saying we had success. <coughs> However, when people start trying to affect another person and remote influence them, what do they always use? Words. They say, you know, turn left, turn left, turn left. Subconscious mind doesn't understand that. You're talking the wrong language. When you affect the person's subconscious mind, you can do such in such do it in such a way that you can affect that person's body. You cannot get information through to their conscious mind. So when we sit there saying something like turn left or buy, buy, sell, sell, or something like that, you may as well just go talk to a tree because it's not going to work. Okay. And this is why most people cannot do remote influencing is because they're trying to talk to the conscious mind. Nobody's home, nobody's listening. And words that are meant for the conscious mind cannot be understood by the subconscious. What do you pass to their subconscious? What do you, what do you get from your subconscious mind? Gestalts, sensories, and dimensionals. If you want to pass something to that other person's mind, what do you use? Gestalts sensories and dimensionals. A unique language, a, a different language. Absolutely. Okay. And people sit down and they try to influence by giving commands. Guess what? Doesn't work. CRV structure. Phase one, you have your first contact with the target in gestaltic terms. Phase two, you have sensory contact and then the aesthetic impact sets up a personal relationship with the target and you get dimensional contact with the target and then phase four gets you ready to do remote influencing work. Now for the other disciplines that are taught by the other teachers, I can't say because I don't know, I don't know those disciplines, but I do know 
that if you try to do your remote influencing work in CRV and you try to do it before you get into stage four, uh, don't waste your time, it's not gonna happen, okay? You've got to get to at least stage four. Okay, the stage four matrix. Let me go through this, all of my students know the answer. What's the purpose of stage one? To get you enough site contact to get you to stage two. What's the purpose of stage two? Stage three. To get you to stage three. What's the purpose of stage three? Stage to get you to stage four. What's the purpose of stage four? Remote to remote view. That's right. When you come for the basic course, I teach you phases one, two, and three, and you go home thinking, I just did miracles, you know? Uh, you hadn't seen anything yet. And uh, in the, when you come back for the intermediate, you get the neat stuff. When you come back for the advanced, you get the really neat stuff, you know? Um, so in the CRV structure, there is not going to be any effective remote influencing until you have gotten to at least stage four. The stage four matrix, and I need to go over this for because we have the different disciplines here. In CRV, uh, I use phase two, Ingo uses stage two. For those of you who don't know, Ingo, when all of this became public, got just flaming mad at one of the people who was teaching, and Ingo put out a request that no one use his terminology. I respect Ingo, I like Ingo, and uh, I respect that request. We had been using slang terms all along anyway, and so I started using a non, not totally, but non-Ingo terminology, which is exactly the same as, you know, the structure and everything stays the same, but all that Ingo ever got copyrighted and made um, uh, proprietary information was the terminology. None of the rest of it was ever classified or ever proprietary information. And so I use a different terminology. I use phase two, Ingo says stage two. I use dimensions, he uses dimensions. I use AI, he uses AI. I say site impact, he says emotional impact. So he's telling you to look for emotional impact. I'm saying look for any impact the site has on you at all in any way, whether it's emotional or not. I use the things column. He uses the tangibles column. I use the conceptual column. He uses the intangible column. I use stray cats. He uses AOL. AOL means analytic overlay. Well, not all AOL, not all AOL comes from anal analysis. That was a hard thing to say. Um, stray cat means the subliminal transfer of recollections, anxieties, and yearnings to consciously accessible thought. A lot of the stuff that gets packed in on a valid impression as it comes through is just your memories, your fears, and your desires, as well as analysis. And so stray cat, to me, to me, tells more of what's actually happened than saying, oh, this came from analysis. Um, as a result, I have cats from the signal line, and Ingo has AOL from the signal line. So you're getting the same thing. Uh, I just honored his request to use a different terminology. Mine is things and concepts. Ingo's is tangibles and intangibles. Stray Cat represents. represents the subliminal transfer of recollection, anxieties, and yearnings to consciously accessible thought. By the way, Ingo doesn't have a term for what I call Tame Cat. Uh, Tame Cat stands for the transfer of access mental energy to consciously accessible thought. In other words, you got the impression, you reported the impression, you did everything right. No pollution, it's perfect. Ingo's only term for that is to slide an M&M across the table to you. So, uh, one of the chapters in my book 
is called the military use of M&Ms. <laughs> when you're working remote influencing, you will work in the SIEI column. Let me put a caution in here. The t-shirt says, watch out for the SIEI column. It really sucks. You can get sucked in. The art of remote influencing is involved in your ability to almost get sucked in, but not quite. And so there's a lot of practice you need to do before you ever try your first remote influencing session. It can be dangerous. Um, getting sucked in can be extremely dangerous. Yes. Don't ever, don't ever work the SI or EI column without a monitor until you learn how to do it because the monitor is there to get you out. The one time in remote viewing that the monitor is allowed to take over the session is when you lose control of the session. And then the monitor is only allowed to take it over long enough to get you back in control. So that's the one exception to the prime directive that the viewer is always in charge. But when you get into the SI or EI column, what information comes through this column is information from the target person's mind. What is that person feeling? What is that person saying? And so on. As you tend to get sucked into that column more and more, instead of describing uh, what that person is feeling and saying, you will start, you will start experiencing it yourself. Uh, there's a graduating degree here. Ever take two magnets, put them together like this, you know? At some point, the two of them snap together and there's nothing you can do to keep them apart. Uh, the SI column sucks in that manner. It's attractive, it's attractive. Oh, it's really attractive. And all of a sudden, kawak, it's, it's over. <laughs> you know, you are sucked in. Anytime you work in this column, you detox. Uh, uh, David was showing you the other day how he detoxes. He starts back where he went into the SI column and goes down that way. Uh, the standard method is to go from the bottom of the session upwards, where you're most involved, go upwards one impression at a time and say, is that them or is that me? Get it out and uh, work your way back up to the point where you began in the SI or EI column. Uh, that's the, the proper method for detoxing. You ask the question, is that the target person's feeling or is that my feeling? Now what you've got to realize is that when you start detoxing, the answer is yes to both of those. And so you have to sit there and you have to say, but is that my normal feeling? Well, no, ax murdering is not my normal feeling, you know. <laughs> Maybe that's something I'm picking up from the, but right now I wanna go ax people, you know. And, um, uh, you know, you mentally access the wrong person and suddenly you start seeing how right it is to molest children or sell drugs or, or whatever. And, um, and you've got to work your way out of that. Uh, so you start with your last impression and you work your way back to the first impression you got when you went into the SI or EI column. Now, everybody I teach to detox that way, they go, okay, that's them, that's them, that's them, this is me, that's them, uh-uh. <laughs> it's like the set aside. Uh, those who've been through my course realize that there is a solid protocol for setting things aside. Uh, there is a solid protocol for detoxing. If you have a 10 page session and the last three pages are, uh, or after you went into the SI and EI column, I would say it should take you about twice the length of your session to detox. You go through it, you establish, you don't just Oh, that's them, this is me. No, you establish and you separate yourself from that person. And you separate yourself from that person completely before you go up one line more and do it again, okay? Most important to detox. 
This is not a toy. This is the real thing. And it has dangers, okay? Dangers of the SIEI column. You can get sucked into the other person's feelings, emotions, their life paradigms, their moralities, their moods, their outlook on life. Anything in that other person's mind winds up in yours. You want to be careful. You can pick up personality traits which continue after the session ends. This is absolutely true. Uh, you don't detox once and uh, somebody will wind up letting you know about it. You must detox after each session in which you access another person. One of our students had wanted to get sucked in. He wanted to feel it, you know. And uh, uh, another student brought in a target, which was of a man getting swept away in a flood and drowning. Well, the man, you know, the man was revived later, but the man didn't know at the time that the picture was taken that he was going to live. And uh, so it was given to this student, and the student started getting sucked in, and he had been just badgering me and badgering me and badgering me. So I said, okay. I'm going to stand here and I'm going to stop it before it goes too far. But you asked for it, kid, you're going to get it. And uh, he, uh, I think, what, he cried for two days, I think it was. He knew that he was going to die in that session. Um, and, you know, I use that, this is what get it, is getting sucked in, you know. The normal method that people use is with a word. Quiet! <laughs> okay. Guess what's not going to work? Okay. You want to send something that their subconscious, not their conscious mind, their subconscious mind can convey to the body. How about that? Get yourself a visual. Simple as that. By the same token, you want to upset someone. There are a lot of different pictures of, of horror, of uh, discomfort, of fear, everything else. You transmit that picture to them and it will affect them. I guarantee it. I was showing this to a student once at Monroe. There was a person uh, in another room I'm not sure I remember remembering this correctly. And they said, how do I influence this other person? And I said, okay, well, was it make them scratch their ear? I think it was. And, um, and saying scratch your ear, it's going to have no effect. But to stand there and feel your ear itching, and pretty soon the woman in the other room re reached up and did like that, you know. And uh, you can cause these things. You want to send a subliminal message that that subconscious mind can put into that person's body. And sometimes your success in doing the RI, uh, you, you just momentarily think, ha, ah, that worked, and you let your guard down, and you get sucked in. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it can happen, yeah, you bet. Okay, any questions so far? I want questions all the way through this because I don't want to go past anything. Yeah. I knew somebody was going to bring that up. No, there is an active thing you do in the EI column that lets you, it's not your intent. There's an active step that you can take in the EI column which can turn it into a two-way street and you can actually put information in instead of just getting it out. I'll cover that in a few minutes. Yes. Uh -huh. If you're a beginner, oh, does it hold here? No, by the time you get to this, I hope you're not going to jump into this, you know, like the magician's apprentice. Don't, don't go home this weekend and try that this week on somebody, okay? Uh, learn to work the stage four. Learn to remote view in stage four. Learn to remote view the, S, the SI column, EI column, without getting sucked in. Uh, uh, what I'm giving you here is, is not something you should be trying this evening, okay? Uh, so by the time you learn to stay in the SI column and keep that separation, uh, then 
Yeah, go ahead and try some of this stuff. Yeah. Any information that you get from the EI column or the SI column, you can put into it um, with generally about equal effectiveness. So if you're if you are strong at getting visuals, or that person is strong at sending you visuals. So you get into the SI column, and what you're getting from that person is all visual. <coughs> you send back a visual. That's the way they think. Okay. Uh, by the same token, you know, if visuals are your forte, then sure, use that. That's that's your biggest hammer. You know, hit the nail with it. Yeah. Okay. If you're remote influencing, and you get sucked in, absolutely. Don't sit there and hurt the person. <laughs> I mean, you're only hurting yourself. Well, you're not, you're also hurting that other person, but you're you're sitting there hurting yourself. Uh, yeah, if you realize you get sucked into that person, uh, treat them nice. <laughs> you know, because uh, if you don't, you're going to hurt yourself. Yeah, EI and SI are the same column. EI is Ingo terms. Uh, SI is what we use. Ideally. Uh, I wouldn't try any beginning uh, remote influencing without a monitor. Right. Okay. If you're sitting there at home alone, uh, I mean, the magician's apprentice syndrome has gotten more people in more trouble than, you know, um, if you're sitting there at home alone, you don't have a monitor to work with, don't try this, okay? Don't do it, yeah. Uh, that's the first failsafe. That's the first failsafe, yeah. Have, have a buddy. Do the buddy system, okay? Have a buddy handy. The basics. You acquire a person lightly. Stress on lightly, okay? Because you're going into that SI or EI column and you just lightly access the person and you start getting some information. Go ahead and get the information. The information may not be important to you, or it may not be important to the session, but the information you're gonna get is important to that person. Uh, you know, the, the greatest uh, way to be a good conversationalist is to learn to listen. Uh, that rule holds true here. Let the person talk. Let them tell you anything they want. Anything they want to get off their mind, just let them go. Write it down. Let them know that you're getting this, okay? Uh, and access them lightly. Set up that conversation. <clears throat> then move to the proper time, event, and so on. Uh, it comes as a surprise to many people that remote influencing treats time the same way as it does space, just like CRV does. Are you limited to remote influencing somebody in the present time? No. You can, inf you can sit down and do a session today which will not influence them to do something for a month. You can also influence the past. We'll get into that in a few minutes. Acquire more deeply. Get into this conversation. Get the conversation going deep. Sympathize with that person, okay? Uh, agree with that person. Unite yourself with that person. Get into a deeper conversation. When you do, you'll start obtaining feelings and emotions and so on. Here's where you have to start really being careful because if you start agreeing emotionally and so on, then that's the beginning of getting sucked in, yeah. The question is, if you set something up to happen with a, another, with a target person a month from now, and then you go watch to see if it happens, are you setting up a pollution? Uh, the answer is yes, and you're also using that pollution as a tool to cause it to happen. So uh, uh, everything in CRV is usable some way or another, even the pollution. And here's, a, here's an example of where uh, you can use the pollution to get the end result that you want. You know how in a conversation you say, you know, you, you sympathize with the person and all that, and then you start 
moving your own feelings into it to try to persuade them to be a little bit different or to change their attitude or to change their mind. So what you do right here, I mean, this is simple techniques of conversation. You can also add your own physical sensations. Yeah. The question is, if you do this when you have the flu or diarrhea or something, is that going to have an effect? Probably so. Yeah. And especially if you want it to. <laughs> David? <laughs> David? Absolutely. This is still a two-way street. Uh, when you put something in, you wait to see if they feel it. It's like a conversation. You wait to see if they feel it. You wait to get the information back. Is that now the way they feel? So the whole time you're doing RI, you do an RI and then you let them converse. You do it, you let them converse. Many people think you just go in and give a bunch of commands and that's it. No, it's a conversation. It's a two-way street and it's back and forth. You only spend half of your time in RI work RIing. The rest of the time you spend listening okay, to see if it works, to see what the reaction is and so forth. You want that person to be excited? Get excited. Okay. What's the best person? What's the best way to make somebody feel down? Go around them all the time, going, eh, you know, and it, it's contagious. You do the same thing here. Uh, these are the simple mechanics of human interaction. Uh, that's all. Really, all they are. Do you also write it down? Uh, the more physical you can get, often the more, the better it helps. Yeah. So writing it down, absolutely. Yeah, that will help. Uh -huh. uh, also, being a database freak, um, when you're doing the session, you want to write down the information you're putting in, so that you'll have a record of it. You can database it, and you can analyze it later to see how well it worked. So yes, definitely. When you're putting in information to the other person, write it down, physically write it down, make it a physical act, and that gives you a record of it. Okay, get out of there. As soon as you've done what you want to do, get out of there, detox. When you write session end, make sure you mean it. <laughs> you bet, yeah. What? A sense of humor. Homer Simpson. Yeah, uh-huh. The techniques would generally be the same. Now, to be honest about it, that's a logical deduction. I have worked this on an entire group within a room, but like a, a demographic, I've never even tried. So, so really the answer is I don't know. Uh, but my experience, I have maybe two or three times worked on an entire group within a room and it's, it's had the effect that was desired, but almost 99% of everything I've done this way has been on an individual. You can detox after you end session. You can also detox if you move to another part of the target. Let's say you have uh, um, been targeted with some political leader, okay? Then you want to go uh, influence that political leader to do something. And then you say, okay, now move one week forward in time and describe the activities going on in that country, something like that. Well, that's the time to detox from that leader. Okay. Uh, and then also at the end of the session, I would detox again just to be sure. Yeah, that's what I was just saying here. Yeah, influence the leader, then move a week ahead in time and tell what's going on in the country. Yeah, you can do that. You have finished influencing the leader. You back out, you get out quickly, you detox, and then you go in with the rest of your session. Uh, that part of the session is over, so then you go in with the rest of your session. But because you did access someone in that session, I would detox at the end of it j again, just to be absolutely certain. That's what's going through the body. 
to your subconscious out into the great unknown, who knows what that is, and uh, into the other person's subconscious mind. The other person will generally have a physical reaction to what's in their subconscious mind. All of us do. And, uh, and therefore, you have basically put these things out to their subconscious mind, which will drive their life in certain ways, but also which will affect them physically. Now, their conscious reaction to the change in physical state uh, will, uh, will be what gets across to their conscious mind. Not the thought you want to put in, but their reaction to their physical condition. You could, uh, but that would take an extra step. Just, you know, hit the road, Jack. Yeah, uh-huh. When you detox, uh, I would move to a time you want to influence that person and then do the influencing, detox, and then move to another time. I would not move to, I would not make time movements while influencing. I. I've never tried it. You could do it, but I don't, I think it would cause a problem with the detox situation. And remember, nothing you can make that person do is worth losing yourself for. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, because if you're a good remote viewer, you're going to get involved. Uh, whether you know the person's name or not doesn't matter. You're going to get involved. Uh, so I think the answer would be no on that. Uh, now, there's probably some exception to that if you're in, trying to influence somebody that you're extremely emotionally involved with, then the answer might be yes. Yeah. The few times that I have done a group, a coherent group, I have addressed the group as an entity, as an individual. Uh, the thing is, there's so many there's so many easier ways to influence a group that uh, that you know it's almost a shame shame to use our eye because there are so many other ways to do it. Like what? <clears throat> uh, uh, well, psycholinguistics, subliminals, uh, propaganda. Simple as that, you know. But if you're dealing with, say, uh, trying to get Threats. a grant, or trying to, <laughs> to get someone to buy something that you have, a product, yeah. then you're, you, you're not going to be able to have access to these people. They're like an unknown entity that's making decisions on your project. Then in that case, you would, you would address the group as an entity. Okay. Yeah. Access briefly to see if the information had an effect. Now, once you have you know, all the way through, you've been having a conversation. After you get out of there, sometime later in the session, when you've separated and all that, you may want to go back and see if the person has new feelings that they didn't have before, have new <coughs> feelings, concepts, and so on. But you detox from that, too. Okay, the question is, do you have to start a whole new session, or can you go back to the session and do it over? Uh, the answer is yes, either way. Or you can even do it before you end that session, just as a checkup, you know, before you end the session. Or you can just go back two days later and say, well, how does this person feel now? By the way, just like a conversation, you're talking to somebody and you're convincing them of something. After that conversation, you may have um, changed their mind about something, but then their normal defenses and all that will work their way back to where they go back to doing and thinking the way they were before. So in any RI situation, you may have to do this many, many, many times, okay, in order to get the new paradigm started. And so this isn't a magic thing where you just go in and poof, all of a sudden the world has changed.
question is, can you just take a break overnight or the over the weekend or something and come back and finish the session and uh, and then do the final checkup? Sure, no problem. Uh, it meets all of the standard rules of CRV. There's no different. Right? Good question. Is there a time? Is there an optimum time to do this? The answer is yes. The question of is there a standard op optimal time? I doubt it. Uh, with each target person, you're going to have to find their optimal time when, uh, when their guard is down. By the way, uh, one of the trivia about CRV, um, people have natural defenses. So when it comes to accessing the SI or the EI column and finding out what's in their mind, you will have to kind of combat those natural defenses some. Uh, what we tend to have found out over the years was that if that person has the ball of white light to protect them from entities and all that, they're probably protected from entities. But they're sitting ducks for remote viewers. I mean, their defenses are down because they think they've got this ball of white light. They're very secure. Their defenses are down. An hour-long session turns into 15 minutes, and you've got the information, and you're out of there. Um, so uh, we'd love it when people get the ball of white light, you know? <laughs> it's great. Yeah. I have good news and bad news. The question is, what's the best way to protect yourself from CRV or CRI? And I have good news and bad news. Uh, the good news is there is a way. The bad news is you'll probably never do it. Uh, you have to be <clears throat> a trained, experienced, highly experienced, and highly involved remote uh, crv -er in order to protect yourself from CRV. Um, so as far as the general population is concerned, uh, the bad news is that as far as the general population is concerned, there is no protection. You have, you have no protection, whatever. If I wanted to remote influence you or if I wanted to remote view you and find out anything in your life, it's your tough luck. There's no protection. Yeah. The question is, if you wanted to reach them at the optimum time, could you go in and say, move to the optimum time and and describe. Usually in CRV and CRI, the simplest answer is the is the best one. Yes, yeah, exactly it. Move to the optimum time and you know and access. Yeah. Is it typically typically better to catch them when they're asleep or awake? It depends on the target. Uh, there's not there's not an easy answer for that. It depends on the target. When I like the general rule, when I like to catch them best is in the hypnagogic state, between asleep and awake. Stan? I'm glad you brought that up. Um, in remote influencing, as I like to see it used for healing, remember that you are only accessing the subconscious mind and putting information in, and the information that you put in has got to be information that's of the type that will cause a physical reaction in your target. Therefore, pay close attention to what Stan said. You can influence them to heal themselves. Okay? You go busting in there like, you know, like the FBI or something, and, and you go in there and try to heal them, probably not going to work. But if you get the proper things into their subconscious, which will cause their subconscious to give them a physical reaction of, of such type that they will tend to start healing themselves, that's when healing takes place. That's one of the things you have to understand when you use remote influencing for healing. Uh, David? Oh yeah, there's still an ethical issue. That's right, they may not want to heal. Uh, there are some people who depend on their illness very strongly. Yes, Stan? I don't think they're using this specific type of technique. Uh, Russell Targ and Jane Katra, uh, yes. Um, I don't think they're using this technique.
I think what they're using is more akin to prayer. Um, by the way, prayer works. It really works. Okay. Prayer works. Uh, and there have been scientific studies, if you need that, to show that it works. Uh, personal uh, personal uh, story here. There's no war story. Um, we were on vacation one time, and uh, <clears throat> uh, we were going from San Antonio to Texas City. I had been getting this terrible headache. My son, Lael, had come down with measles. I kept getting this horrible, horrible headache. And on the way back, right outside of San Antonio, in fact, I laid down in the back seat and went to sleep. I didn't know it, but I had viral encephalitis from the measles, which at that time was 94% fatal in hospitalized cases and 100% fatal if the person had gone into coma before you got them to the hospital. Well, I laid down in the back seat and went straight into coma. About, about seven hours later, uh, Linda pulled into Texas City, where we were going to visit her mother, and uh, pulled into the hospital. And, um, and, you know, they put me in the hospital. Um, the doctor uh, told Linda that there was no possible way for me to live through the night. And uh, so they wanted the insurance papers. And so Linda called our preacher and asked him to break into the house, get the insurance information, call it back to the hospital. Well, the first thing he did about two in the morning was uh, he called a prayer meeting of the church. The next morning, I sat up on the side of the bed and, uh, and I thought, I'm in a hospital room. We must have had a wreck. And I was worried to death about Linda. You know, what happened to Linda? Why, you know, and so on. And I looked, I didn't have any scratches or bruises. And I was, you know, and uh, the doctor walked in about that time. And he looked at me sitting up on the side of the bed. And he said, what the shit are you doing alive? <laughs> I said, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, prayer works. I'm 100% I'm convinced. You want to learn effective remote influencing without going through all the mechanics? Bow your head, pray. It works. Yes. Uh -huh. Can you use prayer as a defense against remote influencing? You can use prayer as an active tool. Therefore, you can use prayer to prevent a remote influencer from doing things. But I would say that once the remote influencer starts remote influencing you, for example, there's no defense. Uh, that's the really bad news about all this. There's really no defense against it. Uh, period. John? No. The question is, once you realize that somebody's trying to influence you, can you go back and, and fight it using the same tools? Absolutely. Uh, I've put one person who actually snuck up on me a couple of times, put her in the hospital twice, and she hasn't done it again. And uh, absolutely, you can do that. There is that defense. Once you've identified the remote influencer, like I was saying to him, you can stop the remote influencer. But once the influencing has started, you have no protection against the influence in. Okay. Yeah. The mechanics of it, uh, we can go into later privately or whatever. I mainly want to go through the basics right now. Uh, Kat, did you have a question on it? Okay. Uh, the question is, when you're firing back, is it, is it always hostile? I have always had the feeling that I hate a fight. I really dislike fighting. Therefore, when I get into a fight, I'm going to make it as short as possible. I go for the kill immediately. And uh, it has never failed. <laughs> and, uh, what do you mean by the kill? Hmm? I go for the kill. Kill. Uh, that's my own personality. Somebody else might get in and sweet talk or something. No, 
if somebody's trying to hurt me, uh, I just go for destruction mode, and that's what I do. So my answer would be yes, it's violent. Yeah, Mike. Oh, if the person gets sucked into you, when you detach. Oh, this was said. Uh, I think Kat said this uh, about detoxing and detaching, and you detox the other person, and you detox yourself. Was that you? Yeah. Never detox the other person. Uh, just get out, okay? Detox yourself. I mean, even if it's remote viewing and you're accessing another person, don't stick around and try to detox that person. Uh, if you do, you're just going to get more involved. Just get out. That's it. Whatever effect you've had on that other person, that other person is going to have to deal with. Just get out. That person, I'm sorry, but you have to take this attitude. That person is not worth losing yourself over. And if you've had a negative effect without meaning to, get out. Go back later and do another session to try to clean up your mess. But get out. Don't ever detox the other person. Yes. What is the method for going back and checking to see if the new stuff is there? Do a CRV session, go into the SIEI column, and just see what impressions you get from that person. But don't influence. If you go into it, if you go into that person the first day and that person is, uh, is malevolent and evil and mean and all that, and you go back a month later, and that person is kindly and loves his family and pets his dog and everything, you've had an effect. Get out. Okay? <laughs> yes. The question is, uh, if you realize somebody's influencing you negatively, can you go in and stop that person from doing it? Uh, again, you can stop the person. You can stop the influencer. And I would, if it's negative, I would do so violently. Make them think a hundred times before they do it again. But uh, the influencing that they have done is now something you're going to have to deal with. There's no way to stop that. You can hopefully detox from that. Uh, you may have to deal with it in other ways. And I mean, in, in really severe cases, you may spend a year or two at an analyst, you know. Uh, uh, like I say, this isn't a toy. <laughs> and uh, once you have been influenced, you may be able to con take control of it, and you may, you're just going to have to deal with it. Now, if you can dismiss it, that's all the better. If, it's some if something has been done to you that you cannot dismiss, then you may have to wind up getting professional help for it. But you would have anyway. So at least you've stopped them to where they don't do it again. Now then, remote influencing yourself, which is another way to clean up some, the mess that somebody has made within you. Remote influencing yourself, remote influencing your own past. This is the one that really is a stumbling block for everybody. <clears throat> remote influencing your own past. Let's say we have a timeline. And on this timeline, we have a moment of decision. Hindsight builds and builds and builds and builds and builds as time goes on. That's when you get your hindsight. Wouldn't it be nice if you, if we had hindsight to help us make our decisions? Okay. Once you have learned to remote influence a target, there is nothing at all, and to do so through time, there is nothing at all to keep you from influencing, doing an RI session and influencing yourself at the moment of that decision. If you know you're going to do this, then you can aid the process by, at the moment of your decision, stop and stay open to outside influences. If you're a CRVer, you'll learn how to pick these outside influences up. 
One of those outside influences that comes in very strongly is the one you're giving from the future, okay? The end result is this decision is not changed. You haven't changed the decision. You have only influenced it a little. Therefore, does this, have you changed the past? No. Statistically, you look at your decisions and a higher and higher and higher percentage of your decisions become the correct decision as you learn to listen to yourself. <laughs> okay. So it's in the statistics. If you're going to try remote influence in your own past, you got to have a database. Simple as that. Because the answer is in the statistics. Yes. Uh, the moment of feedback is in itself reflected into the past. So showing a viewer feedback influences their session. Absolutely. That is why you never take a target, turn it around and hold it up to the light and see what's on the back because you've just given yourself feedback and you have influenced your session. That is why in the thing we did yesterday, you don't have the viewer come in and say, you viewed the wrong target <laughs> because you caused them to view the wrong target. We found out many times that um, when you go to the beaconing sessions, I'm sure, Mel, you've had hundreds of experiences of this where you just totally miss the target and you come back from that beaconing session and somewhere along the way, there's the target. Uh, Ference had a session where, I mean, just totally missed the target. He was down and all that. He was really depressed, saw his feedback, was really depressed, and we said, okay, well, let's go to lunch. We walked into the restaurant, and here was that silver race car with those numbers on it, and uh, he'd had a perfect session, but on the wrong target. And he saw that and got all excited. Oh, look at there, there it is, there it is. Well, guess what influenced his session most? the excitement of seeing that thing reflected back through time and totally screwed up his session. <laughs> we, found out, we found out time and time again, you let a person do a practice session over in the operations building, they walk back and you meet them at the door or at the coffee pot and say, uh, uh, how'd you do? It was, the, it was the devil's tower, wasn't it? <laughs> Well, guess what pollution is going to be in their session that they've already done? Descript descriptors of Devil's Tower. Right after, after you have received your feedback. That's right. You're not going to change the past. However, in the statistics of all the times you do ARV, the, the statistics will show that you get the right answer more and more and more often. So you, you said that right afterwards when you miss, you feel, you know, despondent, dejected and all that, that emotion is going to help you influence your past to not do that, okay? If after a, uh, an ARV session, you succeeded, you got money and that elation, you sit down and do an RI session, the emotion of the elation is going to help you decide at the moment which target to pick and, you will, and to pick the right one. It will discourage you against the bad target, it will encourage you to get the good target. And so that moment of emotional reaction after you see the feedback, that's the optimal time to sit down and do an RI session on your moment of decision. Yes. Can I make a there are times when you want to discourage yourself against the bad one. Lynn, I'm talking about yeah. every moment of feedback that an ARVer receives. Mm -hmm. That target, when, when I, he is shown, he, her, or him, right. they're shown the moment of feedback. Right. That experience should be pleasant. That's right. and rewarding for the for, viewer, always. That's right. For ARV. For ARV. 
if you're using remote influencing, that rule doesn't apply anymore because you want to influence yourself to feel despondency and sorrow when you go trying to get the wrong target. Okay. And so when you start using RI, that rule doesn't apply. Now in straight ARV, that rule applies. Okay, because, and that answers your question, I think, Angela, when is the optimal time to build an RI for your ARV feedback? If the protocol is set that the task for analyst is going to provide feedback to you, and the rule is it's always going to be a pleasant experience, well, you've built that RI right into your program. It is always going to be a pleasant experience for you, Angela. And you're going to say, but John, what if I miss the target? I'm going to point out everything that you got correct in your session at the moment of feedback for you. Okay. And that qualifies as waffling. It, it's a, you want to know what it qualifies? Waffling. qualified it about me getting 15% or 20% okay. more accuracy when I implemented this rule of okay. project. Okay, so, but you know, uh, it may be a useful tool, but you're using waffling as a useful tool. Okay. I'm not saying it's bad. Okay, all right. That's a good use for waffling. And it is yeah. all right, and it is, <laughs> you're damn right. Yeah, uh-huh. Okay, go on. Yeah, you had the next one, then you had. Uh, go ahead. Can you then give us, uh, go over that again, and if we want a remote, and I'm a little confused if you're saying, if we're going to use RI for ARV, shouldn't we always try to give the pleasant feeling and go on a good target rather no. than try to program negative no, feelings for the target? No, because uh, uh, you should do both. Yeah, okay. okay. Go ahead. That was it. Okay. Yes. Just a quick alternative. Uh, would an ARV session instead of a remote influencing session uh, be just as good? Yes, uh, picture of the sun, no picture of the North Pole. Very good. Associative remote viewing that way. Actually, John's shaking his head no. Actually, in a way to use it, the answer would be yes. In many ways it would be no, but the concept it, I would say yes to. Let me move on with this. We can argue argue about angels on the head of the pen later, okay? <coughs> Buy the house. That's your question. Where do you start? Uh, you go through stage one and finally you get the house. You work the house and house and house. You get into stage four. You have worked your way into stage four, so now you're qualified to say, move to the moment of decision, should I buy the house? You move into the SI or the EI column, you access yourself. What do you put through? Yes or no? Yes equals the emotion of, okay. <laughs> no, the emotion of, <laughs> you buy the wrong house, <laughs> you're, you're in that situation, I guarantee. Yeah. Um, this is not something we normally teach unless it comes up in a class. You know, I say the SI column, four, four things and, and get out of it so that you won't get sucked into the other person. The same applies to the AI column. A person can stay there too long, get sucked into themselves, and what happens is they get into this meditative state, the session grinds to a halt, and then you have the problem of getting them out of the mental equivalent of staring at their belly button, you know, and, uh, and they get sucked into themselves. Yes, that can happen. Uh -huh. Oh, yes, this is done after, this is the RI session. Okay, right. so I've already So what am I putting back? Yes, no, I'm putting back <coughs> this and my emotional reaction to this. Okay. okay. Oh, I see. At the remote to improve. I'm sorry? At the remote influencing stage? At the remote influencing stage after I know whether I should have bought the house or not. Okay. And is that going to change the fact that I did or didn't buy the house? No, you're not changing the past. <coughs> you're simply putting hindsight into the moment of decision. So you're saying that you made the right decision? If you made the right decision, then uh, yes, you so would put. Of the future, that's right. Okay. Right. okay. So uh, for instance, we found a house in Ruidoso. We were looking for a house. We found a house in Ruidoso. We wanted it. It was what we wanted. It was perfect for us. 
and we sat down in the realtor's office to sign the papers for the house and I had been doing this for years. The moment of decision came and I said, not going to sign this paper. The house was perfect for us. I mean, it was exactly what we'd been looking for. It was lower than uh, lower price than what we had planned. It was perfect. It was everything we had looked for and wanted. And something said, don't sign those papers. We searched for another two months and we found the house we're in now, which is fantastically more suited to us than that one ever would have been. After we moved into this house, got everything settled down and all that, I sat down and did a remote influencing back to the moment when I had that pen in hand in Ruidoso, New Mexico, and was about to sign the papers, and I got across, uh-uh, <laughs> don't sign those papers, you know. And I put negative feelings into that. It reflected into the past, and at the moment of that decision, my hand came back up, and I said, I'm not going to sign, okay? And I'm forever glad that I did. The pictures here, uh, the actual input is obviously not your reaction to the pictures, right? Your reaction to the pictures, not the pictures themselves, okay? They're both happy and funny. Yeah, they're both happy and funny to the observer. Yeah. How do you think the mule feels about it? <laughs> yeah? So I guess it's the mule now? Yeah. <laughs> so then? Uh, if you come to the moment of decision right now, stay open to the emotions that you're sending yourself back from the future. You say, okay, do I want to buy this house? And you get a negative vibe. Uh, uh, listen, follow those. If you get a, somebody tries to give you tasking for a session and you get the negative vibes, follow that. You didn't spend all this money to learn to be psychic for nothing. You get those negative vibes. You don't know what it means. You have no idea what it means or why, and you can't see any logical reason for those negative vibes. Follow the negative vibes. Then later when you find out why it had to be that way, sit down and send back the negative vibes that you will listen to and therefore not do the thing that would have been wrong. Generally, you will come to some point where you say, I think, that was a good decision or a bad decision. You may not have hard proof, but you just, you just feel, okay, now's the time to sit down and do that because I feel. Now, that brings up another point. I buy the house, or I don't buy the house in Ruidoso. So I buy this house, the one we live in now, and I'm happy as I can be for five years. And then the house starts crumbling the airport extends to our backyard and all this, and all of a sudden I'm thinking, man, I shouldn't have bought this place. Okay, so what do I do then? Sit down and remote influence myself, not to remote influence myself, you know, to make that decision. Uh, once you do it, you live with it, you know. <laughs> Oh, you could complexify it all you want to, but you're just going to mess yourself up when you do. So at the moment when you say this was a good idea, this was not a good idea, sit down and do the session. Then session end and live with the results. Okay. okay? Associative remote viewing, this is what everybody's been talking about at this conference and all that. Remote viewing is not good at getting numbers. It is good at getting sensories such as tastes, smells, colors, textures, sounds, temperatures, and so on. Let me explain what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about ARV in its simplest, most basic terms. One of the problems with doing ARV this way is that it takes it's harder to learn and it takes a longer time to learn and it takes much more practice. I'm a firm believer that once you go through all of that, 
you wind up a better ARVer. However, if you use CRV in an ARV mode, which is what John and Marty have been talking about this weekend, the results come faster. Uh, many people think they, they become better. And so when I say I think the hard work leading to the better result, uh, that's my opinion only. You'll get, you'll get opinions otherwise from, from everybody else. The main bottom line is what you're trying in ARV, does it work? You, you make the money off the stock market, Hey, <laughs> who's going to argue with that, you know? And that's the bottom line. Okay. And so CRV is good at getting sensories. So let's do some very simple, basic ARV using nothing but sensories. It's also good at picking up emotions, by the way. Okay. If we associate a sensory or an emotion to a number, then we can indirectly view the number by simply viewing the sensory or the emotion. How ARV works. I'm going to make a list and I'm going to say zero equals vanilla, one equals vinegar, two equals chocolate and so on. And I'm going to make this list. You can make it randomly. You can have a computer make it. You can have a friend make it. It doesn't matter. Okay. Then let's go to this timeline. Here's a timeline and I'm going to set up a hard and fast event in time that will happen and I will take every step possible to make that happen. It is a fixed event in time. 7.30 p.m. The first ball of the pick three pops up. Okay. 9 p.m. <coughs> Taste according to the number on the ball. Okay. The ball equals, the number in the ball equals one. I look on the list and I say, oh, look at there. I taste vinegar. Okay. Now then, what determined what I taste? The number on the ball. Okay. At 10 a.m. this morning, all I have to do is sit down and do a CRV session and say, task, what will I taste at 9 p.m. tonight? My mind goes forward to 9 p.m. and says, mm, I taste vinegar. It brings that information back and I write down at 10 p.m. in the morning, at 10 a.m. in the morning, I write down vinegar. Okay. The chart says vinegar equals a one. I would not taste vinegar if there were another number on that ball. So what's left to do? Buy a ticket. When you're well into a CRV session, you'll tend to get the sensories in a very real format and you'll tend to actually physically taste it. Yeah. Or get a hint of it. You bet money on vinegar. You don't bet money on the ball. <laughs> okay. You turn this over to someone else who looks at the chart and says, here's what the numbers are going to have to be. Okay, what if a two comes up on the ball? At 9 p.m., what do you give them to taste? You give them chocolate. I'm sorry. I, the taste is determined by the number on the ball. So if they say vinegar, doesn't matter. You say, oops, we got it wrong. Well, that cost us 50 cents. We'll try it again tomorrow. Okay. Right. With uh, actually, um, actually, no. You need three numbers, right? You could have one viewer do three sessions, or you could get three viewers, each one of them to do a separate ball. <coughs> now, on the pick six, how many numbers, how many digits do you have? 52. 12. 12. Digits will come up on the six balls. Pat, can you explain that a little more? Okay. The first ball pops up and it's 23. Oh. You've got two digits, two and three. 
The second ball pops up and it's 18. You got one and eight. The third ball pops up and it's 22. Oh, look at this. Now then you've got three digits in this whole thing that are all twos, okay? So in a situation like this, I would use 12 viewers, each targeted against the next digit. If you have the luxury of using 12 viewers. The question is, can you just do this using move commands with one viewer? Yeah. Sure, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, move to 9 p.m. and tell me what you taste. I taste vinegar. Now, move to 9.05 and tell me what you taste. The feedback for the second ball is going to be at 9.05. Now, move to 9.10 and tell me what you taste. The feedback for the third ball is going to be at 9.10. I like to use three viewers instead of one viewer moving forward in time. What about moving, uh, viewing daily for a week? Uh, you still got the problem of any one day. Oh, you mean like for the pick six? Yeah. Uh, sure, you, you could do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, move to the time of the picking of the second ball. No, because you're viewing your feedback in, in ARV, you're not viewing the target. So you say, move to the time of your second feedback okay. and describe. Yes. If you have 10 targets, 10 <coughs> options like this, you would go after the two. If you can find 52 totally distinctively different tastes to remote view, go for it. It's easiest to view the first digit and the second digit with only 10 distinctive tastes. Uh, it's a mechanical problem rather than a mental problem. Uh, if you had 52 totally distinctly different tastes, sure, you could do it. Getting 52 totally distinctive different tastes, that's very difficult. Okay, the question is, can you use different sensories? Like color for the first digit, sound for the second digit? Sure, you can do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. If you're doing the pick six, each ball is going to have two digits on it. Yeah. So you can, I would use a different viewer for each digit. Yeah, so you're always, and is it always consistent that that one viewer always does the first number on the first ball? That's what you task them with. Yeah, the other one always does the second number on the first ball. That's what you task them with, right. On, a, on the pick six lottery, every ball has two digits. Okay. On the pick three and the pick four lottery, every ball has one digit, okay? So it depends on the lottery you're going for. That's right, yeah. By the way, uh, talk about a little illegal illegalities here. Um, uh, if you play the pick six and you win, the government will wind up taking away in taxes and brother-in-law charges and everything else probably about 90% of everything you win. If you do the pick six, uh, pick three and you win $250, you're supposed to report that on your income tax. That's, that's my, okay. Uh, enough said. If you get to where you can do this on a dependable basis, and you buy 20 tickets a day and get them all right and $250 on each, then you have a moral decision as to whether you're going to declare it on your income tax because the state does not track those tickets. I would say, yes, declare it on your income tax, okay? But you might want to look at the situation as a whole to see whether you really want to go after the pick six or not. Okay, any questions on this? You can do an RI session at the end of this, which will add information to this session to give you a statistical advantage to help you pick the right number more often. <clears throat> okay? I'm sorry? Ingo won the, won the pick three seven times in one month. Um, 
and yeah, there are other people who have who have uh, had great success. Uh, as far as success at ARV, yeah, we've got, probably got the two leading success stories right here in, in the room with us, Marty and John. Uh, yeah, this stuff works, really does. Okay, numbers? how would you RI to, uh, to get the numbers? In a simple sensory thing like this, I'm not sure it'd be worth it. But now in a situation like where you're using CRV targets, whole targets, mm -hmm. instead of just a simple sensory, yeah, then once you see the feedback information, you can say, oh, that's a farmhouse. Boy, I remember being on the farm once and you know how it smelled and all that. Access yourself, put those farm smells in there, put the, the bucolic feeling in there, the uh, feeling of space and hominess and your grandparents and the, the peaches that grandmother used to can and, and you would eat and all that. You put all that stuff into the moment of your decision, um, in the moment of your session, and you're going to start getting all this stuff that says, "Hey, this is a farm. This is this is Grandma's farm," you know. And uh, it will help you get the right target. It will put the emotion in to help you pick the right target. Oh. ARVers do not view the numbers; they view their feedback. Uh -huh. They turn their report summary into John or Marty. And that's who works the numbers. If you pump back, if the correct feedback is the farm scene, and you pump feelings and emotions and everything into the moment of your session of a farm scene, guess what you're going to get? You're going to get a farm scene. Uh -huh. The idea of helping you deal with numbers, forget that. When you're working ARV, your only task is describe the feedback I'm going to show you. As a remote viewer, that is your only task. You don't have to know what the numbers are. You don't know, have to know how much was bet. You don't have to know whether anything was bet or not. You just describe your feedback. That's all you have to do. Yes. Oh, no, like I was saying, in a situation where you're using only basic sensories, I wouldn't bother with the remote influencing. What I'm showing here is how ARV works in its simplest mode, okay? So I wouldn't use RI in this. But when you graduate from this to the targets that Marty and John are using, which are full-blown CRV targets, then you can pump all these emotions and everything back into the moment of your session to help you get the right target. As a viewer, you don't do ARV. As a viewer, you view your feedback. You turn the answer over to whoever's running the ARV project, and they get the numbers, they get the betting, they do the betting, they get the money, bring it back to you, and so on. As an ARVer, your job is to describe your feedback. That's all you do, okay? So don't get the numbers mixed in or the lottery or anything like that. If you're gonna work as an ARVer, describe your feedback, that's it. You would have sensitized yourself to learning from the future, okay? okay. Now then, let's say you put information in from your own future. Mm -hmm. How much effect does it have on the session? It has this much effect. Okay? okay. None very, very little. I mean, it's that much effect. You do that 12,000 times, and pretty soon your hand is so sensitive that it can feel it coming, all right? Practice, practice, practice. Without practice, you're not gonna do any of this. The, the act of doing RI on yourself for these ARV targets is nothing more than the Chinese water torture. The drop hits your forehead, nobody gets hurt. It hits it again. Hours and hours later, this drop is like a hammer, right? You sensitize yourself to information from your own future. 
Once you have done this, these RI sessions on yourself, hundreds of times, your accuracy rate will go up close to 100%. What if you could go through life never making a mistake? Wouldn't it be great? Can you enhance yeah. The question is, can you make the feelings that you put back in there more traumatic and more exciting and therefore have a greater effect on it? So by making your, the feedback emotions that you're pumping into your past session, will that help more? Uh, it would be easy, easier to pick up, I would say. I would say so too. Okay. Yeah, simplest answer, yeah. <laughs>
this basic CRV techniques. The subconscious likes basic sensories. It also likes stories. Here we're getting into a whole new realm. We're getting into what he was asking earlier about uh, analogies, symbolism, and so forth. It also responds strongly to emotions and don't forget your ideograms. Basic to, just as basic to our eye is practice your ideograms. <laughs> it's really important. Okay, we can come back to this. One most important fact to remember about RI, you can't bribe a dog with a dollar. You go out and offer a dog a dollar not to bite you, you know, what's he gonna use a dollar for? You have to, just like in a human conversation, you have to start talking in the other person's terms. This is gonna get you sucked in. So you have to walk that tightrope very, very carefully. But you have to talk in this other person's terms. You have to find out what triggers their subconscious most, and that's the way the terms you have to start talking in. Anybody not understand this principle? You customize every remote influencing session to the target, not to yourself. How do you know what's going to impress them and what they're thinking and all that? Stay in the AI column with, I mean the EI column or the SI column without, get the information, not the AI, the ER or the SI. I messed up there. And collected more and more information about them. Once you've got the information of how they feel, what they think, what they're interested in and all that, then go for it. Example RI project. I worked with Dr. Mann, specialist in hypertension, high blood pressure cases at Cornell University Center in New York City. Uh, the stated purpose was to remote influence 12 chronic hypertension patients to decrease their blood pressures under laboratory conditions. Each patient had dangerously high blood pressure at the beginning of treatment. Each patient would be remote influenced only once. I argued with this, but I lost. We did it only once. The Cornell Project, Dr. Mann notified me when a patient would be on blood pressure monitoring device for at least 30 minutes. I tossed a coin to decide whether I would work the target or not, because we had to have a control group, and the control group would be those times when I didn't work the target. I recorded the result, but I did not give the results to Dr. Mann. He stayed completely blind as to what I was doing. He only kept the blood pressure records. It was after the entire project was over that we compared my work time with the blood pressure records and the exact times there. Uh, Dr. Mann kept all the data on the patients throughout the study. The method that was used was I would access the person normally, uh, use visualized analogy. I would start using a story to address the problem. Now, we really haven't, anybody in here, we really haven't gone into depth in the idea of using symbology, analogies, and allegories in remote influence, in remote viewing, but you can also use it actively in remote influencing, and it's very effective, by the way. Manipulate the story to bring about a desired conclusion before stopping. The patients for whom I worked the RI sessions showed an average drop in blood pressure over the targeted time of 25 points beyond the expected norm. A high blood pressure patient sits there for 30 minutes doing nothing, the blood pressure is gonna fall. When I did not work the session, it was at their standard rate. When I did work it, it generally wound up anywhere between 10 and 45 points lower than was normal for that patient because he had, you know, he had dozens and dozens of times when they were sitting there on the blood pressure meter. The patients for whom I did not work RI showed no unusual change. The project was continued with three targets per week for four weeks. The results, a direct and measurable effect was shown and recorded and the data was kept on it. The effect was both repeatable and dependable. Every time I worked, there was not a single time that I worked that it didn't have an effect. So it was dependable. When patients returned to their daily lives, any effect diminished and disappeared. So you lower somebody's blood pressure and then you send them back into a stressful situation. What's gonna happen? 
What would you expect? The amount of effect was considered enough to potentially save someone's life in a crisis situation. The amount of effect was not enough to bring patients below hypertension level. You've got somebody whose uh, who's top reading is 270, uh, 275, and you bring it down 25, hey, they're now at 250. They're still about to kill, keel over dead, you know? Yeah, yes, I would love to do the study again. Uh, I'm convinced because I know that RI is repeatable and has more effect each time you... Cumulative. It's accumulative, <coughs> yes. And uh, the uh, thing that Dr. Mann had wanted to find was whether it was curative or not. When he saw that the patients went back to their life and their blood pressure rose again, he said this, is, this may be a good stopgap, but it is not curative, especially when only done once. And therefore, he was no longer interested in the study and he cut it off. I suggested that we do a long-term work on each person repeatedly and in depth to strengthen the effect, that we test other, other protocols by working on separate individuals using different protocols, one you know, direct emotional in, installation, one using allegories and stories and all that. Uh, since the preliminary work did not show it to be permanently curative, he lost interest and the project was basically over. <coughs> How was it done? I set up a metaphor. I pictured myself standing on a hot, dusty road. Now, this is one of the patients, okay? This wasn't every patient. One of the patients. Uh, I pictured myself standing on a hot, dusty road with something coming at me full speed. I got the other person involved. I flagged the thing down that was coming at me full speed. I started describing the metaphor on, in my session. You then have to meet their initial uh, rejection of what you're doing. And that rejection will always be there. And so I said, uh, uh, I flagged them down and uh, uh, I said, you know, there's a waterfall and all that that's really cool. There's a nice, cool place to go. Um, would you like to go there? The response was, no, I've got, you know, I've got to get on. I've got to get on. And you deflect this. Now, this is standard techniques, okay, of salesmanship and all that. I immediately said, look at those deer out there in that clearing. Okay. The response was no. And immediately I deflected that response and said, look at those deer out there in the clearing. The interest got started. We went together to go see the deer and hide behind the trees in order to look at the deer without being seen. Once we got into the trees, I created a clearing. There were some water sprites that were swimming around in this, in this pool and there was a beautiful waterfall. And then I started backing out. <clears throat> I got the water sprites talking to the target person. I started distancing myself from the story. And I got the target person interacting with the story itself. And I backed out. Now then, as I backed out, uh, that left them <coughs> involved in the analogy that I wanted. And I set that analogy up to be an extremely peaceful, extremely enjoyable uh, analogy. Got them involved in it, you back out and you let them run with it. Every now and then, well, you still have to stay close enough that you can start seeing when it goes bad. Because, you know, in this case, all of a sudden uh, they would say, oh, but, uh, but, you know, if I jump in, I could drown, I could drown and, and all this. And you get back in to the thing and you change the story in such a way that it's safe and so on. And then you back out and let them go with the story. And, uh, and as you do, what happens is they are involved in this story and their blood pressure 
settles right on down, okay? And this happened repeatedly, and it was, it's dependable. You can use these analogies, but one thing you've got to remember, and it shows up on the slides here, <clears throat> is that once they really got into the story, you go in and you think of how great this place is and wouldn't you love to come back and then you get them out of there. Don't let it go sour. Get them out of there, quit on a high and leave them wanting more, okay? Now that applies to the blood pressure patients. It's the standard practice for remote influencing. You wanna influence somebody to be violent? Put them in a situation where they're gonna love that violence and right as they're really getting into it, yank them out and leave them wanting more. That is what is going to show up in their physical and the physical impressions are going to get across to their conscious mind and that's what's going to influence their actions and decisions from that point on. So, yes. so for instance, if you're trying to promote a project or a product for somebody, um, you would try to get them to examine your product, enjoy the product, get excited about it. And then get them out. And then get out. You bet. Leave them, always leave them laughing, always leave them wanting more, okay? okay? This is basic sales. <laughs> no remote influence in here, okay? How do you engage them? I mean, how do you go against from the observation? Okay. How do you engage them? <clears throat> You're influencing, and then you back out, but you don't back away completely you back away far enough that you're now doing remote viewing on their feelings, their uh, emotions, their sensories and all that. You wait and you just remote view without influencing until things start going sour and then you click back into remote influencing mode again to straighten things up, back out and keep track on their impressions and so on. This is a very nebulous thing to talk about. Uh, the best analogy I can use is, how do you engage someone in a conversation? There comes that moment when you say that first word. You want that first word to lead them into a conversation, so you go into a conversation, really all you have to worry about is that introductory sentence, you know? So just uh, hey, I lost my phone number, can I have yours? Yeah, you know, babe, you know, uh, is it going to work? <laughs> you know, you stay physical. You wind up with an entire story in the paper. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. You also wind up with the written record of what you influenced. Yeah. You involve them in the metaphor that you want. Now, a neat thing is during this thing, we wrote down, <clears throat> we had the uh, patients write down what they were thinking about through the whole time they would start daydreaming. Their daydreaming never once matched my metaphor in content, but it always matched my metaphor in story, in storyline. The content was always totally different, totally unrelated, but the storyline <coughs> was always the same. The, uh, the content wasn't, but the... The storyline itself, okay. the plot, of the story was always the same. The content never was. Can you give an example of a story they might have come up with? Uh, yeah, on this one here, uh, the woman was uh, uh, going out to hang wash, and she was she was carrying all this stuff. Uh, somebody came up to her and said, you know, instead of hanging wash, uh, let's let's go shopping. And, uh, and she said, no, I can't go shopping and all that. And they said, well, hey, look at those women in that dress, you know, that were walking down the street. And so instead of going shopping, they went over to talk to the women who were walking down the street in this beautiful dress. And as they did, they passed by a dress store. They got involved in the dress store and she started talking back and forth to the uh, clerk who is extremely friendly and so on. The storyline matched my metaphor. The content was totally different and that happened every time. They make up their own story content, but you guide the plot.
The question is, are males or females more susceptible than the other? I haven't found any evidence either way. Dr. Mann asked them if they would like to be involved in a project which might lower their blood pressure, and they said yes. I pictured myself standing on a hot, dusty road. Yeah. Okay. And then I flagged down this thing that was coming toward me, and I said, <clears throat> uh, I said, there's a quiet pool with a waterfall. I tried to get them involved. Like to see it? They will always resist. No. And I said, hey, look at those deer. You always deflect the resistance. You invite the other person in. They will always resist. You deflect the resistance and you go on with the story. Uh, involved the other person. We went aside into the forest to watch the deer. Uh, I created a small pool with water pool, waterfall. We stopped and watched these sprites swimming in it. Uh, I moved the focus of the story to the target person, and I moved myself out of the story as much as possible. I turned the story over to the target, and from that point, I start doing remote uh, viewing just to keep track of what's going on in that person's mind and emotions and all that moment by moment. I keep the target involved. Anytime they started getting off of the storyline or started getting emotions that I didn't want in there, I went back, joined myself to the story, affected the story, and then I got back out again. Don't stay too long. When the story appears to be having its greatest effect, access the target briefly make them feel the desire to have more of this and then get yourself and them out too. Detox yourself, but by all means, do not detox that person because if you do, they will lose the desire to come back. Okay? Uh, another example, there was a secret factory. Uh, the tasking was to find out what went on inside the factory, which had been spotted by satellite imagery. The factory had been. <clears throat> Regular viewing left many questions and it was decided that mental access might answer them. I was told to access someone at the factory who could provide the information we wanted. I found that the person really could provide the information we wanted was the factory's director. I accessed him and I didn't have any success with remote viewing. So then I asked him about himself personally. I, I got off the target of what's in the factory and I started finding out about him. I started this conversation, okay? Uh, I found out that he had a son to whom he longed to show off what daddy does for a living and he had this pride and he wanted his son to be proud of him, but he was constrained. He was in a classified job and could never tell his son. And so, I set up the scenario. I pictured his son being in the factory. I fi pictured the son following him around, holding his hand and so forth. I made the first suggestion. Show it to me, daddy, okay? The resistance was immediately there. No, son, I can't. Hey, dad, what's that? Okay, and pointed to something. Uh, as I remember, it was a typewriter. Uh, it was something which was not classified and which it wouldn't hurt to show him, okay? And so the resistance was deflected. Involved the other person. He started showing his son the one unclassified thing, and I physically, during my session, swelled up with pride and just felt pride in my dad and all this and just pumped those emotions into that session. And then I, I grinned, did everything I could to get a physical reaction that I could pump into that other person. Um, the son continued to ask, I got out of it. Once I got him involved in his daydream, then I got out of it. The only time I would ever get back in was when he started getting distracted or stopped the daydream, you know, wanted to stop the daydream or something like that. <clears throat> Each time I had to go back in, I would have the son say something that was really great, you know, that every dad wants to hear and, and all that stuff so that he would swell with pride and pleasure. Uh, the uh, focus stayed on him. 
Now, as I backed out, you know, on the uh, blood pressure patients, I was keeping track of whether they were telling, uh, I mean, whether they were feeling what I wanted them to feel or not. It's not what I did here. When I backed out, I was doing the remote uh, accessing of him because I wanted to hear what he was telling to his kid. And that man was going around the factory showing his kid, explaining like you would to a child, explaining all this classified stuff, explaining what daddy did, how many people daddy was over, and, and so forth. And the whole time he was doing that, I was sitting there taking notes because I was getting that, uh, the information that we had been targeted to get. The only time I would go back in to influence was whenever he would start thinking of how this wasn't permitted outside of his daydream and all that. Now, don't stay too long. When I had the information we needed that I was tasked to get, I sent the physical stimulus to bring him out of his daydream. He quit on a high. I provided him with a good and warm feeling about the episode along with a strong desire that it could be so. And boy, this was a great daydream. I'd really like to do this again, but I have to get back to work now. And in doing so, I left the door open to come back for another RI session to pick up more information. Okay. See how it works? Back. Quit on a high. Uh, we were never tasked with that one again because the uh, information I had collected was sufficient and uh, it told them everything they needed to know, so we never got tasked again. <clears throat> Could you do this in the civilian world to find out what your competitors are doing? Sure.